Yeah, I wanted to welcome everyone out to our October uh, DevOps Utah meetup uh, and appreciate our, our speaker, Samuel Rufi, who's going to be talking to us shortly. I wanted, to, I wanted to give just a plug for Salt Lake City DevOps Days. That is coming next year, March 13th and 14th. And we currently have a call for speakers open. Uh, we're looking for um, presenters uh, that want to give like a 30 minute talk, uh, workshops possibly, like two hour workshops or labs uh, or simulations. Um, and uh, the theme is DevOps is dead, evolving DevOps. So kind of a interesting uh, topic as we continue to evolve in our uh, DevOps skills. Uh, that call for speakers is open until November 6th. So if you'd like to present or you know someone would like to present, please uh, submit a, an application. We're going to be reviewing those in November and make decisions before uh, the end of the year. Also, just another plug for meetup presentations. We try to do this every month um, and we can do them. If it's a local person, we'll try to meet in person and provide food. Uh, at, at a local venue here, or if uh, often virtual works pretty well. If you if you're not here local, we can do it virtually too. We do it the second Wednesday of the month. We don't do one in December, but every month we have one scheduled in November. Probably take December off, and then we'll we're back on schedule in January at least until uh, March. We won't have one because of the DevOps days, but. With that, those are all the announcements I've got. Um, I'll turn the time over to Samuel. Um, we're going to go about, well, we have, have this scheduled till 7. So we usually do about a 40-minute presentation and then questions and answers uh, last last 10 minutes. Um, I'll also be monitoring the chat if you have questions so we can ask those at the end as well. So with that, Samuel, let's turn the time over to you all stop sharing my screen and and you go ahead awesome i appreciate it hey everyone uh good evening good night um for everyone joining appreciate it let me just get my is uh, sharing my screen quickly here can you maybe just gonna thumbs up or confirmation if you can see my screen fine can you hear me fine is there any background noise i have like a dishwasher running but i don't know if you can hear okay awesome Sounds good. Uh, perfect thank you so I'll do my best to be on time here. This presentation can be a little bit convoluted, so I'll do my best to keep us on time. And you know, I know it's we had probably all of us had a long night, a long day, and you know, it's a it can be a long night. So maybe just a quick intro on my side. Uh, my name is Samuel Barufi. I am a solutions architect with Amazon Web Services. I'm based in New York, uh, and I've been with AWS for close to four years. Uh, my main job at AWS is to, to support global financial services on their cloud journey. So you can imagine I work from like networking, containers, you know, grid computing, AI, Gen AI, pretty much anything supporting my customer um, that is part of the global financial services. I, I have a background in networking before joining AWS. I was a network engineer in, as a, you know, I had a computer science with minor in a network engineering uh, degree. Uh, I've also been a network engineer for quite a bit time in, in previous jobs. Um, so I think this is a pretty exciting service and I just wanna share what it is and how it works for folks that are into the AWS ecosystem. I just wanna mention that, you know, if you're not familiar with AWS and potentially a little bit of the foundational of AWS, this might be, you know, probably some of the concepts are going to be hard to grasp in the beginning. I'll try my best once you have questions to clarify. But if you have an idea of basic networking on AWS, uh, hopefully this will make sense and, and it will help. So the name of the first service is, of course, PPC Lattice. And the idea is just to simplify application networking, right? So a quick agenda for what I plan to do today is just talk a little bit about a journey of both a developer and a company trying to publish application into AWS, into like a very enterprise level um, into AWS, or it requires a lot of different AWS accounts, a lot of different VPCs. What does entitle and you know what are the challenges that you have with that? Uh, then I'm gonna talk a little bit about you know how modern applications are supposed to be with microservices, you know, um, 
you have a lot of application mesh, what are, what those tries to solve. And then finally, how VPC Lattice have a very opinionated AWS way to solving that into the AWS cloud. Um, I'm going to talk about some of the benefits, some of the common use cases. There are a lot of use cases I could explain today. I've only selected two for the simplicity and the time that we have. And hopefully if we have time, I just want to do a quick demo. I always try to do demos because, you know, by the end of the day, presentations can be boring. Demos are kind of cool. I can fail miserably as well because I'm going to be doing live demos. Uh, so I think that is kind of the, the cool part. If I have questions, just put that on the chat. You know, Brett and I can can answer, can, you know, go through that in the end. Um, but, you know, feel free to just put them there and then unmute yourself. So without further ado, uh, you know, a lot of companies for decades have been, been have been building big monolithic applications, right? And we've seen for maybe the last decade or over a decade, a lot of organizations moving into microservices, right? So when you're deploying monolithic into AWS, you normally can only deploy a single monolithic into a single VPC. For folks that are not familiar with VPC, VPC just stands for virtual private cloud. It's a virtual isolation, network isolation for your specific AWS environment. So on AWS, you have up to 32 regions available that you can deploy. And within those regions, you can create VPCs. You can have many VPCs per regions and there are different architectures and design decisions of how we wanna you know, decide if you go with a single VPC or multiple VPCs. Normally, you're gonna go with maybe a couple of VPCs per region you know, per account. Just to set the stage, big enterprises have thousands of different AWS accounts with hundreds of different teams and thousands of different engineers, right? So moving in the past, you just have a monolith, you put on a VPC, very easy to manage network, right? Everything is within that bubble, within the virtual private cloud. Now, when you start decoupling microservices into maybe different teams, different maybe regions, maybe different accounts, AWS accounts, you start having a scenario where we're going to have some microservices in different VPCs. If you are familiar with VPCs and now you connect that on AWS, there are things you can do at the network level that you connect to VPCs. So for example, if microservice one wants to talk to microservice three, you know, you need to, by default, they can talk to each other. So you need to do some extra networking configuration, security configuration to connect them together. Right? So, it's really important that you know we 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 call at AWS something that security is job zero. It's the most important thing is how are we creating network and permission boundaries across these microservices, right? So in this case, you can imagine at a very simple level, you have VPC one, VPC two, and you know that is the boundary, right? Everything with VPC one can talk with each other if you allow. There is a specific configuration that you can define if you don't want that. But let's say by default, every service talks to each other on VPC1 and the same with VPC2. Now it gets to a point that, okay, this is a good isolation, but it's not good enough and granular enough because you have a problem with IP uh, you know, address. Each VPC, we need to have a side arranger. So it's a, just a, a range of IP address that are associated with the VPC. And when you have these type of VPCs connections, it's really hard when you have overlapping IP address. So let's say you have 192.168.0.0 on VPC1 and the same uh, side range on VPC2. When you try to connect them, it can become very complex. There are solutions and workarounds, but it's very challenging. Now, you know, okay, it's good when you have just four microservices, but you are very probably familiar and aware maybe on your own organizations that you're going to have many, many services, right? I love a talk from Netflix. And I think this has been like maybe seven years ago, they started doing this talk or even more that talks about the chaos of, you know, scaling microservices. And they have like a graph where they have like thousands of microservices and, and the dependencies between them. It can be very complex, right? So when you, when you get in this scenario on AWS, we have a lot of different VPCs and those VPCs maybe are within the same account, maybe across different accounts, uh, you know, maybe even a VPC from a customer. 
it gets very complex how you define the boundaries and the security permission across those services, right? So as a developer, when you look at this, you, this is just noisy, right? Like if you're a developer and you look at this, like I shouldn't care about this. I just want to build my microservice. I want my microservice to be able to talk to other services or things talking to my service, and it should be simpler to do that, right? Well, we're going to get how we can help solving that, that spe specific aspect. Normally, when we talk about microservices, one of the beauties of microservices is, you know, you can have different tech stacks and you can have polyglot technology. So maybe you have a container on service one, then you have, you know, Lambda on service two, maybe you have Fargate on service two on containers, maybe on service five, you have an EC2. Depending on what you're trying to achieve and the comfort level of whatever team you're building, you it's very common to have different architectures and different deployments across different services, right? An example, when you look at Amazon.com, it's full of microservices. Behind the scenes, not every single microservice runs on the same architecture. They're all different. Some EC2, some Lambda, some Kubernetes, some Elastic Container Service. It's very spread. So you get to a point that, okay, I can only rely on this specific tooling for containers because I might have some services that might be running on something else, like a Lambda, or you know maybe Kubernetes, or maybe EC2. So that is another challenge. And now you define the boundary across those, those specific uh, applications. And this is a funny one, but I can agree, right? Dev developers shouldn't be in the business of managing networking, right? Like that's not what you know developers are supposed to do. Developers, in my opinion, they are they should be focused on business value, you know, de developing business logic that will help the you know both internal tools or external tools achieve their specific goals, right? So everything else, you know, both from infrastructure configuration, network configuration, in my opinion, is just noise that should be abstract to give developers the freedom to just go and use a cloud provider or maybe use you know an application that can be deployed easily. But developers shouldn't be a wizard network, but sysops, devops, whatever you want to call platform teams need to have control over how the network is architected, right? Security's job zero, like I said. So you don't just want to give full access for developers and not that we shouldn't trust developers, but you want to have some way of controlling the security and permissions of all those boxes and different services that are talking to each other how are they actually configured and what permission should be allowed to be given, right? So developers shouldn't do that, but definitely network engineers and DevOps and whatever is part of your organization, managing network should be focusing on that aspect. And this is where it starts to getting really complex, right? I, you know, this is kind of the beauty. If you're familiar with AWS, you know that there are many ways you can connect two, VP, two VPCs together. One way that is not recommended at all, you can just have a public service uh, that you know you go over the internet gateway, you go over the internet and you just reach the endpoint, right? Another way is just doing VPC peering. It's just literally connecting using the AWS backbone networking uh, to connect those VPCs. So traffic will go within AWS infrastructure, will never leave, will never leave AWS, but it's some extra configuration you need to do. And of course, there is transit gateway. It's for complex network uh, configurations. You can, you know, have a central point that you can connect multiple VPCs. You can have direct connect. You can have VPNs. Uh, you know, you can have many things connected to different regions and different AWS accounts. You can use transit gateway. But it, if any of you have used transit gateway in the past, you know it can get very complex. You kind of need to be a network specialist, right? It's not as simple as just clicking a button and configuring. There are a lot of functionality and understanding that goes into that. That is just to say that, you know, again, developers and application teams shouldn't worry about that. So normally and traditionally at AWS, you'd have infrastructure teams getting this configured and properly, you know, secure then developers would be able to start deploying and you know, uh, develop on top of those VPCs. So that is currently some of the challenges that exist. And again, right, like what, you can deploy whatever you want on a VPC, right? Like it could be a Kubernetes, it could be a Lambda, it could be an EC2, 
depending on how you configure that, you're going to have different networking configurations, different network routing. And it, it, based on that, you need to configure, you know, transit gateway, VPC peering, private link, or even internet gateway appropriately. You don't want to be in that business, right? It, but it's more than just connectivity, right? The challenges that you face, you know, trying to have an enterprise level application at AWS is not only network connectivity. Into a, into a big microservice environment, how do you do service discovery? Let's say you have a new team. Now, do you need to manage DNS? How do you make sure that the security of whatever service needs to talk to this service? Let's say service four needs to talk to service 10. Who controls that permission? How are you doing load balancing? You always want to do load balancing maybe across different availability zones for you know, resiliency and, and availability. How are you doing authentication and authorization? How are you monitoring that, right? So there are a lot of questions that goes beyond just network connectivity, right? And just keep in mind these points because you know, I'm trying to kind of ramp up when it gets to VPC Lattice and hopefully I will tell you that it solves most of these problems, but these is the challenges that are, you know, it's are solvable challenges. There are solutions depending on the environment you use that can actually solve this, but it can be complex and time consuming, especially when you have a very mixed environment. If you're all on Kubernetes and you just use, you know, your own app mesh or, you know, Istio on Envoy, you kind of get that by default and it's fine, but as long as far as, as long as you try to use something else, you start getting into those problems, right? That maybe, you know, Istio and App Mesh won't support uh, the, your infrastructure and your applications. And again, the application part, I kind of talked about this already, right? How are you doing service discovery? Are you putting your own DNS on Route 53, which is the DNS service on AWS? Are you doing, you know, API management on API gateway? But then, you know, some services are not on API gateway. How are you doing health checks? Maybe you're using load balancer, network load balancer. You can, you know, pick and choose, you know, the cool, the cool and the bad thing about AWS is you have so many options that you can choose what you want, but it can, be, it can become very complex if you have a decentralized way like microservice um, deployments. So, the, I like this graph because you know when you look into so on the on the left you have you know the complexity the network complexity and on the bottom you have you know a application modernization right so on the left being you are monolithic and you know on the right you're fully microservice normally the application you know you start just with a few load balancers and firewall configurations if you have a monolithic remember you have a single VPC it's kind of easy and you don't need to worry too much. Then you move into containers. Okay, now we started talking about the cluster. You have maybe different containers, network interfaces. You have in and out controllers. Maybe you're using, you know, um, you're using load balancer controllers or using Nginx or you're using maybe Apache or uh, Kong as your API. Whatever you're using, you have that complexity. But, you know, when you really mature companies that are doing microservice, they go, they go and they have a service mesh solution, right? So I mentioned before about Istio, uh, you know, app mesh, you name it, which will do all the things in a container environment, right? So you'll be able to just have um, your application layer seven uh, inspection, right? You have service discovery, you pretty much just deploy a new service and anything can be discovered automatically. Uh, but the challenges that comes with that are now, because they are not fully managed most of the time, and even if they are fully managed, you need to deploy sidecars. So on top of deploying your own application, you need to deploy another piece that only manages the proxy, right? Or the service meshes, right? And it's really, zero, it's really hard to get zero trust architectures by default because it requires a lot of configuration. If you ever try to deploy a service mesh, into this polyglot environment, you probably have faced very complex uh, scenarios and hard to achieve exactly that. And it gives very lower agility for cloud administrator. And this is a good point because you might be helping a lot of the developers, but now having this complex environment, cloud administrator or network engineers get into a place that they get a lot to manage for, and so the price of having this complex architecture is very high for them. I talked about you know some of the 
the, the sidecar proxy based in microservices like Istio, AppMesh, Console, Likrd, and Kong, you know, the main challenge is you need to manage the control plane, right? Maybe it's a managed service, but someone needs to manage that control plane. So that control plane is keeping, you know, everything, all the service discovery, all the, you know, load balancing, all the, uh, you know, connectivity in place. But it's, you know, the control plane always needs to be up and running and it needs to be highly available. If the control plane goes down, your whole system goes down. So there is a big dependency on the control plane. Also, there is a big cost issue because now you have a control plane that you need to manage and pay. And every single microservice that will deploy, you need to have you know, a sidecar deploy with it. I know Istio has just come up with a, a, a sidecarless approach, but for now, let's just consider that you need to deploy a sidecar, which is still true for most of uh, you know, service meshes, right? So we talked about some of the challenges, right? How can you know my presentation help you learn a little bit of what AWS have um, have delivered that potentially can be useful for some organizations? So the name of the service is Amazon VPC Lattice. The idea is is to provide connectivity across any VPCs, and it can be within the same account, it can be across accounts. The idea is you don't need to think about it how to get one VPC connecting to another VPC. You just create a service uh, network, you create your service on VPC Lattice, that service can be currently supported as EC2, ECS, Lambda, and EKS, and instance-based, so, and you know, you can have a load balancer there. So you pretty much support anything on AWS, you can just put a load balancer if it's not defaulted, supported here. And you'll be able to have overlap IP address, which is amazing. So you can have the same IP address on across two VPCs uh, and they can talk to each other and you don't need to manage anything. You just literally configure VPC Lattice and VPC Lattice will do all that crazy network configuration that I talked about. It can talk across IPv4 and IPv6 as well. So as you know, IPv4 is, we are, is slowly running out of in the internet. So we are trying to push more folks to use IPv6. And this is an example of the service supporting by default. But um, you know, another cool thing of VPC Lattice, the control plane is managed for you. It's a managed service. So you just like, and it's a managed, highly available, resilient service using AWS regions and availability zones is gonna deploy automatically behind the scenes, the control plane across multiple availability zones and it's gonna be highly available. So you don't need to worry about that. You just focus on your services and service creation. Another cool thing that I love about v VPC Lattice that you know also solves some of the challenges we talked about it is by default you have observability, so you'll be able to see a lot of metrics that are trying to you know who is trying to connect to your service, what is the HTTP because VPC Lattice is a layer seven um, on the OSI network stack, so he understands HTTP and HTTPS and TCP of course. So he knows how to load balancer based on URI, but he also knows how to collect the logs and the metrics for that. Uh, and you know, final, but you know, but not least in, in that sense is authentication, right? You have that complexity services. How can AWS, uh, sorry, Amazon VPC Lattice help with authentication? There is something called, um, I think it's called security rules, if I'm not mistaken, on VPC Lattice that allows you to create complex security rules that, you know, you can say this service can talk to this service, but this service can only talk to service X if they are authenticated using an IAM role. So there is a lot of complexity and support for authentication and authorization, both at the network level, but also at the application level. So all that, you know, traffic management for authorization and authentication can be managed by VPC Lattice. And the idea is trying to achieve the zero trust uh, architectures, right? With a single policy. And you see that why this policy exists. Remember I talk about two personas, the developer and the admin. The admin now can take control of the security policy. And in a single place, it can manage thousands of different services centralized, right? Before, you probably need to go to 100 different places and very confused and very uh, complex. Now it's just a single place you can manage that. If it's not making sense, hopefully in the demo, you will. <laughs>
But how it works is you have different components, different concepts on VPC Lattice. So you have a service network and a service network is just literally a network that can have many services. And that serve, and so a service is just a unit of application. So you can have, let's say, you see on the demo, a payment service. Maybe that payment service is backed by a container, right? You just create a service, that service is going to be displayed on the service di directory. So you can have thousands of services and different services can be part of different service network. So once you put the service inside the service network, everyone that you have configured and given access will be able to communicate to that service and have you know, service discoverability using just DNS. The cool thing is all these services can be across any VPC and any AWS account. As long as you have the proper permission to configure, you can just you know, put on any VPC and automatically VPC Lattice will do that crazy network um, communication that I explained. And the auth policy, so I will correct myself because I said security policies, the name is auth policy, which is a declarative way that you can have uh, both the traffic management, but you can also have authorization and authentication at the application service level. So you can see here, that I can create a service network, which is the bigger a square box uh, on, on the left here on my image. And the service discovery is just all these different services, service A, service B, and service C. But I have service A actually living in one VPC. I have service B living in another VPC. And I have service C just being a Lambda, right? That doesn't uh, just live on maybe another VPC or does, doesn't even have a VPC because Lambda doesn't need to run on a VPC. So that is kind of the concepts and you see on the demo that I'll try to plug them together. Uh, you know, going back to the same picture I showed before, when you look at Amazon VPC Lattice, you have the fully managed control plane. So the control plane piece, you don't need to manage or even care about it. So there is no side proxies, sorry, there is no proxies or sidecar that you need to manage. You'll be very simplified the connections across any service using AWS. One thing that is important to highlight, uh, one of the limitations of VPC Lattice, because I don't want to just sell VPC Lattice and not talk about the limitations, I want you to be aware, currently VPC Lattice can only talk within the same region. So you can have hundreds of different accounts, but VPC Lattice cannot talk from one region to another yet. That might be a feature, uh, a future release, but for now it's just across the same region. So I know it's a very, a lot of customers ask for a cross-region VPC lattice that is not yet available. But if it's within the same region, you can just have a lot of VPCs and you know you can do HTTP, HTTPS and TCP. Another, another limitation for now on VPC lattice, it doesn't do UDP. Also another very requested uh, support on VPC lattice is UDP, you know, at the layer four protocol. So, Manage, I talked about managed control plane, uh, single policy engine using the odd policies that I talked, and you can reduce the blast for troubleshooting because now you have a single place you go for, and you can just you know see the services, see the configuration. And you know, the cool thing about when you create a target group on VPC Lattice, which is just literally your application, it can manage and automatically create load balancing for you. And you see on the demo what I mean by that but it can automatically create the load balancing. So you don't need to go on you know, AWS, create a load balance and then link with VPC Lattice. You just have a service running on a compute environment. And if you want to have that load balancing, you just choose a target group on VPC Lattice that is load balancing. And then VPC Lattice is gonna take care of also creating that load balancer for you. For now, you'll be like an elastic load balancer, a layer seven load balancer. Kind of talked about the benefits, right? But you know, just very quickly, I'll talk about these uh, five benefits. So, the benefits of using VPC Lattice first, it will increase developer productivity because no more network troubleshooting or chaos. You enhance your security posture because you have a single place that you can have very granular permissions for security, so you can audit their logs. You have optimized compute choice. So now instead of, okay, just forcing every single developer to be in Kubernetes because you're using Istio, now you can still have a service mesh uh, solution, but that can be 
uh, pretty much transparent of what you choose within AWS. Of course, VPC Lattice currently only support AWS uh, uh, resources. It doesn't span across cloud providers. And you have improved the scale and resiliency because now instead of you having to manage your control plane, the control plane is managed for you. And as a native AWS service, AWS takes care for the scalability and availability of that. And pretty much reduce day two operation costs because if you have large environments, uh, you know, with fewer resources, you can just centralize everything into a single network environment. So those are kind of the benefits, right? Some of the use cases, and I'm gonna dive into maybe a couple in a moment, but you can have security and simplified VPC connectivity. So you don't need to manage transit gateway, VPC peering, private link that is completely out, out, out manage and automated for you. You have granular permissions using zero trust. So there is a, you know, the auth policy is something that is probably worth a three hour talk on just how complex it can be. It doesn't need to be, but if you want to have a very granular permission, you can use that. And traffic manage at scale, you control hundreds and thousands of services and VPC lattice will just manage that for you across multiple VPCs again. And you can have a streamlined service to service. So now the objective of having hundreds of microservices talking to each other, you know, VPC Lattice actually achieves that. So some examples, right? Like just very simple, some examples. So this is probably the most simple example where you want to have a, so VPC one is a service called billing, right? And it lives on VPC one uh, and it has, you know, you have a public endpoint on Route 53. But now we have VPC2, which has parking, right? So parking uh, and billing needs to talk to each other, right? So you can have on parking, having let's say on parking, you have a couple of different endpoints, right? And some endpoints live on EC2, some endpoints live on Lambda, some endpoints live on EKS. You can create a single service uh, and then have the service using a load balancer type with elastic load balancer, and you can do a URI, uh, you know, Man, uh, URI traffic management and routing. So you can say for slash uh, parking billing, or oh, parking billing is a bad idea, but for slash parking New York goes to the EC2, for slash parking Utah goes to the Lambda. I know it's a bad example because nobody will do that, but I'm just trying to paint the picture on how you can be granular configuring um, um, you know, your services. So, okay, this is good. The VPC lattice will make the communication and link both together, but it's not very fun, right? Not very complex. Now, a more complex scenario is, let's say you have one, you want to have granular secure access using zero trust. So you have this two VPC one that has billing service, you have VPC two that has parking service, but you have now VPC three, which is inventory. And inventory shouldn't be able to talk to either parking or billing. Maybe it's, it's consumed by other service. You put all these three services within the service network, but then on your what policy, you say billing cannot communicate with inventory. So billing can go and talk to parking and you know billing won't be able to talk to inventory or either the other way around, right? So you create these granular permissions and now this example only has three, services, but you can imagine having maybe thousands of services and having that single point of management, you know, on who can access what. So one of the cool things about VPC Lattice, if you're a Kubernetes person, this will probably make you happy. Uh, you know, I am a container guy as well, and I don't want to manage uh, VPC Lattice outside Kubernetes. I just want to create a YAML deployment, go on my Kubernetes, and I want that to communicate with VPC Lattice and do all the, the things I've just discussed. I want to you know, create a service network. I want to create a service. I want to associate the service with a target group that are containers, um, you know, which has, sorry, the target group is a Kubernetes service and the target itself are pods within my service, right? So there is a very cool open source uh, integration called AWS Gateway API Controller. So you can deploy this API controller on your Kubernetes and automatically EKS and Kubernetes will talk to VPC Lattice, will talk to AWS based on a API, based on a Kubernetes gateway API interface. When you deploy that interface, it will automatically create all these resources for you on the cloud. 
So as a Kubernetes developer or a Kubernetes DevOps person, you can just focus on you know, creating service um, YAML and making sure you have a proper service YAML that it connects to a, to a gateway on Kubernetes and automatically you do all the other things I talked to you uh, um, by default, right? So it's pretty cool if you're in Kubernetes, take a look on that. There is a nice open source documentation. The name is AWS Gateway API Control. And I think I'm good with time. Uh, I think we can probably pause here. Before I do the demo, do you wanna maybe Brad pause for some questions? Maybe I do the demo before, whatever you wanna do and I'm comfortable uh, with. Sure. Is it, if you have questions, you know, just unmute your mic or put them in the chat. So, yeah, so I'll do the demo and then maybe there'll be some questions there. So let me just start the demo. Stop sharing here. I'll share my, my screen. Okay, bear with me. Okay, that should be it. Let me just confirm, let's see. One second. Just trying to find, I have so many windows that I don't know which one I need to share. Just square on a sec. Okay, here. Okay, found it. Sorry about that. <laughs> okay, so let me actually, let me jump back to my presentation because I want to explain what the demo is about and that wasn't the presentation. So let me just jump back there. Uh, here, okay. So hopefully you can see my screen back. So what I want to demonstrate is I want to show you how simple it is to manage you know, VPC Lattice. I have already created this. So I have a service network called the Super App Service Network. Within the service network, I have um, four different, I mean, three different services and I have a client, right? So I have a client VPC, which is going to be like, let's assume that VPC that client VPC is trying to connect to these services. Maybe it's your front end, maybe it's whatever it is. Just assume uh, that that's where you're connecting from. So this client VPC is connected to the super app service network. And within the super app service network, I have two different services. I have the reservation service that only has one endpoint, which is a Lambda function that is uh, being served on slash reservation. Then I have the parking service and the parking service is a little bit more complex. Instead of just having one URI, I have two URIs. I have slash rates, then you go to an auto scaling group on EC2. Uh, and I have a payments VPC that you go to a payments uh, instance group on auto scaling, right? So that is what I'm trying to do. What I'm gonna go, I'm gonna jump into the uh, bash terminal for a instance that lives on the client VPC and it's do some crows. Uh, to demonstrate, you know, how this can be put together. So let me share back the screen. So quickly, so hopefully you can see my screen. Let me just move this around. So if you go on the console, right, the first thing I want to show you, so this is just once I'm kind of demonstrating this only within a single account, right? I'm not, I don't have multiple accounts but it could well be that these services were spread across multiple accounts. So if I go on VPC, right? The VPC is just a service on the console. If I go on VPC and I look at the VPCs that I have. So if I click your VPCs, you see that I have five different VPCs, right? I have a reservation VPC. I have the client's VPC, the payments VPC and the rates VPC. And I have this other VPC here, which is just the default VPC that comes with any single AWS account. Now, if I scroll down and you see here VPC Lattice, I will start with target groups, right? Because target groups is the where you kind of start configuring and hopefully I can show if I have time, I can show how you can configure that. But on, on the target groups, I have three target groups. I have a reservation target group that you can see it's a Lambda target type. So this is just literally triggering and invoking a Lambda every time I talk to you. And you can see the ports here. The Lambda doesn't have a port because it's by default is not sharing any network. It's just a nice VPC lattice integration. It's doing that integration automatically for me. And you can see that the VPC that this, um, that this Lambda is, is on the, I'll show you, it's on the 
reservation VPC. So if you see here, Lambda is living on the reservation VPC. Now I have another target group, which is a type of instance on port 4242. So you can be very granular how you configure that. And the protocol is just HTTP. And uh, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll be able to click here, but the VPC pretty much, the VPC ID is just uh, the rates uh, VPC. And you can see the, the thing that is connected, you see in a moment, in an, is an instance. So if I go inside the service, sorry, the target group, you see that there is an instance, this is just an EC2 instance that is healthy because VPC Lattice has a health check that is able to go on my slash path and actually could, you know, verify, okay, it's responding with 200 HTTP, it's all good, right? Nothing complex, very basic HTTP load balance, right? Now, the other cool thing you can do, you have the payments target group, which instead of being a instance-based target group, is an application load balancer. And this application load balancer, it's so it's checking for my application on port 80. And you can see that the application load balancer, if I were to click here, you see that my application load balancer has a target listener. I'll click here just to show you. That is a... So the cool thing about this, even though it's an instance base, behind the scenes, this is actually selecting a auto scaling group. So the instances that are going to be thrown here are based on an auto scaling group. So let me go back and I'll quickly show you here. So I have the target groups. You connect target groups into services. So remember, I had two services: the reservation service and the parking service. The reservation service will only have a single association. So if you go on routing, you'll be able to see that the reservation service is just listening on port 443 and is sending the traffic to my reservation target group. Nothing fancy, right? Just go to slash, uh, slash reservation on HTTPS, you'll be sent to these HTTPS. Now, if I go on the parking, I can start being a little bit more complex. On the routing, I can say that if you go to slash rates, I want you to go to rates target group. If you go to slash payments, I want you to go to the payments target group. So I have services. The last thing I need to do, and I know it sounds a lot, but you literally only do this once. Um, the ne next thing you need to do is associate all these services with your service network. So you can see I have the services associated here. I have both the reservation service and the parking service. And then finally, how do I get how do I give access for my client VPC to talk to this service? It's on the VPC association. So I'm saying, okay, this VPC, which is the client VPC, is allowed to talk to these other services. And I don't think I'm going to have enough time to talk about access, but you can see here, I'm not blocking anything. It's very bad practice, practice but this is just a demo. So I'm not blocking anything. Every single service can talk to, you know, every single... Uh, resources on my client VPC will be able to talk to any service that I have on my service network. So pause me if you have any questions. I just have one more thing I want to share, which is finally talking to the services, right? Let me show you how this works. If you go on the service level and I click, for example, on reservation, each service will give me, remember, it does service discovery automatically. So it creates a DNS entry that is only resolvable within my account. So I can just copy this. And this is, if you remember the routing, this is a port 443, so it's just HTTPS. So if you just do a curl, let me just refresh this instance here, just bear with me. If I do curl, HTTPS, and I go here, there you go. You can see, hello from VPC Lattice Reservations. Nothing fancy, but it works, right? So my VPC is now talking to that other VPC, all the network complexity that I discussed is taken care of for me automatically. Now, if I wanna go to the other service, which is the other service is a little bit cooler, right? Because we have a couple of URIs we can go through. So if you go on the service parking and I copy the, the endpoint, and remember I have within parking, I have rates and I have payments, right? So if I go crow, I decided just for the sake of the demo that this service will be an HTTP, not an HTTPS. Not good practice, but you know, for the sake of argument. If I press enter, you might be, this will work. And you, you say, why is this working? 
I will show you now that on the service, when you create a service and you create a routing for a service that has multiple routing, you can decide the default. So if I don't pass a path, a URI path, you always go to payments by default. So that is exactly what I did, right? I went to payments. I, I, I didn't provide any URI. You went to payments. But now if I provide rates, you can see hello from rates. So I know it's a very simple demo, but behind the scenes, there is a lot of network connectivity that are put in place to allow this to actually work. I'll pause here because we only have 10 minutes. If there are questions, I know I talk a lot. So I'll pause here. Let me know if this was useful. Please feel free to share feedback. If this was not useful at all, I'm always happy to receive feedback, even if it's bad. Yeah, yeah it was good. There's a few questions in the chat. Um... Oh, okay. Awesome. Let me check. Okay, so Chip Austin is saying, I have had developers flat out refuse to even learn about network. They went nothing. Exactly. I've seen that before. I've, you know, it's, you know, there are developers and developers. I, I don't want to generalize, but most of them, you know, they just want to focus on coding, which makes sense, right? So Matt is saying, I assume CT doesn't do cross region. It won't do cross partition. It's standard to GovCloud. Yeah, that's a good question. I don't know if, VPC Lattice is available on Golf Cloud. I can check that, um, but I know it's not cross region. I don't think it will be. Let's check VPC Lattice Golf Cloud. Let's check if it's available. I don't think it is. You can look at the regions. Anyway, I'll check later, but I don't think it's available on Golf Cloud. It's something that you can talk with your account team. They might be able to add your influence, right? Uh, okay. I love that there are questions. So, Jay, does VPC Lattice eliminate the need of VPC peering? Yes, love that question. You don't need VPC peering. You just have two VPCs, forget about network. You just put that on a service, put it on a service network and off it goes, right? Forget about peering, forget about overlapping AP address. It's all taken care of for you. So yes, that's why I, you can see that I'm excited about this, right? <laughs> um, so, and Chip Austin saying, VPC Lattice looks a lot like a service mesh. What advantages would VPC Lattice have over service mesh? Very, very good question. I think the main advantage is it's opinionated AWS environment, right? It can be an advantage, it can be an advantage. But if you are fooling on AWS and you don't need to manage anything, right? If, for example, AWS also has AWS App Mesh, which is a container service mesh. That only works with containers. It doesn't work with EC2, it doesn't work with Lambda, it doesn't work with load balancer, right? For me, the main, there are a couple of reasons why I think VPC Lattice has some advantages. The first one is it's full AWS, right? So it doesn't matter what you run. And in the future, we will support UDP and you support cross region. I don't know when, I don't have that information, but it will. So it will be kind of the unique service that allows you to do that for a polyglot architecture, if you say so. Now, the question is cheap. If you have just container uh, architecture deployed, right? Maybe just Kubernetes. Should they go with VPC Lattice or should, should they go with Istio? It's really a question that you need to make. My point is, even if you only have Kubernetes, right? But you have Kubernetes across multiple AWS accounts and multiple VPCs, you still need to do the VPC networking, right? The VPC connectivity doesn't go away. So you still need to do that. VPC Lattice solves that, right? It really depends use case by use case. I know I'll sound like an architect because my job, I always joke around. If anyone asks me a question, I'll say it depends because it's literally, it depends on the use case and you know, what you're trying to do. But those are the advantages I can see. And let me know if that helped or not, Chip. Chip, I'm, I'm happy sure. to probably check some a little bit. It helps. I mean, but there's other things that you get out of a service mesh too, uh, like end-to-end -end encryption. Yeah. Uh, so there are some things, obviously, that the it doesn't look like Lattice does that you would get out of a service mesh. So. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. That that is a good point. If you have your eight, if you have your endpoints HTTPS, they would be end-to-end -end encrypted, right? So they will go. You can. VPC Lattice gives you the ability to, so it doesn't wrap like a service mesh that you don't need to care and it's always end-to-end uh, end encrypt. But if it's always HTTPS that you allow within your network, that is going to take care for you because again, it's just by default encrypting, right? But you have a point. It doesn't do that by default, like a service mesh. 
So yeah, you have, thanks for sharing that, very good point. And, and I think Jay is saying, is VPC Lattice supported by AWS CDK? I'm pretty sure it is. Um, let me, let's check the constructs. Yeah, I think it does. So if you can see here, AWS CDK. Um, so I, it's always a good point, right? It does support CloudFormation. If you're familiar with CDK, you can do, uh, you know, the, I think I forgot what it's called, like the, the different abstraction levels, the objects abstraction. So I think in this case is not a transparent higher level abstraction. It's just, you know, trans, translating the cloud formation resources into, you know, the CDK is just translating to cloud formation resources. I don't think there is a higher uh, abstraction, but, you know, I'll need you to, to probably do some, um, some Googling and research. It does support VPC Lattice as just cloud formation um, resources that CDK will translate for you. Um, are you saying CDK currently has uh, L1 construct for VPC Lattice, but not L2? That, yeah, I don't know about the L2. I know L1s he has. On the L2s, you need to do some Googling if he has, uh, you know, the abstraction. For what I can see here, it looks most CloudFormation L1, layer one. I don't know if there is L2s. Um, so I'll probably need to check that. Actually, never mind. I think there is, because if I look here, those are L2s. So I, I do think, it, I don't know if I have fully support, but this should be an L2 abstract. Yeah, so you see this, for example, default action property, and let's say here, um, a path match property type. I think this should be, yeah, this should be an L2. I don't know if there is higher abstractions, like an L3, like that you just do a single construct and it does, uh, but it's something that we, you know, maybe a good GitHub issue for that. Okay. Well, I was going to do a VPC peering app for one of my CDK projects, but you've convinced me to do a VPC Lattice project instead. Yeah, yeah, great, great. Give it a try. Feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn if you have any issues or if you hate it. Always happy to hear, you know, folks trying. Because you might want to try and it's like, oh, this is too complex. Feel free to let me know. I'm curious to know how your experience will be. I'll keep you in the loop. Thanks, thanks, Jay. I think Matthew is asking, did I see correctly that your demo VPCs had overlapping CID? I would love to find out more about Lattice support. Yes, thank you for that question, Matthew. VPC Lattice doesn't care about overlapping IP address. So you can have exactly five different five different VPCs with the same CIDR range and VPC Lattice will take care of that for you. So it's taken care automatically, right? Of course, one of the things I haven't talked about is pricing. This is going to be because AWS is taking care of more things for you. It's going to be a little bit more expensive than if you were to just use VPC and VPC peering. So Jay, I guess a good highlight for you is just keep in mind that, you know, cost, it will be a little bit more expensive because you'll be paying for the request data processing and some service um, uh, per service pricing, right? So you can get pretty expensive, but there are benefits. So it's always a balance, right? Maybe there are architectures that you don't need VPC Lattice because they are simple. I see VPC Lattice really useful for more complex uh, applications or companies that don't care about pricing, which I haven't met in the future. I haven't met yet, maybe in the future. <laughs> so maybe that is a good highlight. Uh, and I think those are the questions. Um, I, think so we're Matt, I, I had a follow-up question on that one. Um, yeah. So, so would you recommend using like VPCs and VPC uh, and Lattice instead of like VPC with multiple subnets? So, like if you had subnets that separated databases and app servers or EKS uh, for some compliance issues. But then I know like we have to implement, you know, route tables and, and do all that. It sounds like that Lattice handles that for us to, yeah. to, to manage the, the NATed addresses across those subnets. It yeah. Would, is the recommendation is don't use subnets, but just use separate VPCs for that separation. And, and then Lattice would let you do all the routing pretty easily without having to set that up. That. Yeah, so it's a very good question. And there are different ways you would probably think an architect. I wouldn't recommend every single service on a VPC because there are limits of VPCs you can create per account. 
the way normally I like to orient customers and folks are more like team based, right? So you might have a team or an application or you have an or you have a specific VPC and you deploy multiple services within the VPC, right? That makes sense. But then you route because you don't need like even though it's called VPC lattice, you can have multiple services within the same VPC, but it still have VPC lattice to manage, right? So it's not a requirement that you have one service, like my demo had the bad example because it's one service to one VPC. That, that should never be the case, right? You probably want to put you know, multiple services within a VPC across different subnets, and then you can have VPC lattice manage everything. The good thing, and you know, based on my recommendation, is on bigger organizations where you have different maybe sets of microservices, depending how you group them, or maybe different teams, it's very common that you have maybe a big company that have five different teams. Each team will have its own VPC, so it knows how to control like databases, subnets, and all that. It's just using VPC Lattice to expose all those services, right? So I wouldn't go one-to-one. -one. I think that is a bad recommendation because you are gonna get into limit issues, but I would use VPC Lattice to expose those services, even though they are within the same, um, within the same VPC, I guess, right? Because it gives that complexity management. Okay. So not sure, Brad, if I answered the question. Happy yeah, to. no, yeah, that was that was helpful. Awesome, thanks. Um, I know we are time and happy to stay a little bit more. I was planning on doing more, like deploying a new, what I planned for the demo, if I had more time was like deploy, create a new Lambda and create a new service. Uh, if you guys want to do that, I'm happy to do, but I know our time and, and it's evening. So whatever you guys prefer, I'm, I'm happy to. <laughs> uh, do we have other questions? Well, I think, I think that's good, Samuel, then. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll post this uh, later tonight on our YouTube and to put that on in the meetup as well. Uh, but appreciate um, the presentation and the demo. And Thank you. again, everyone, if uh, call for papers or call for speakers again, um, go to our website, Salt Lake City DevOps Days, and uh, submit a paper. And, and if you'd like to do a presentation in the upcoming months, just let me know. You can just do that through Meetup and get one of the organizers and we'll, we'll get back with you. So yeah, but this. Looks like a great solution, Samuel. Thanks again. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Uh, have a great rest of your night, everyone. Yeah, everyone. Stay safe. Thanks, bye Samuel. bye. Thanks again. Bye.